Joseph of Arimathea, who had not consented to the decision to kill Jesus, goes to Pilate, offers the tomb, and together with Nicodemus, who we've met before, lay him in the tomb. The women from Galilee see the tomb and how the body is laid there. Then they wait. They go and prepare spices and perfumes, but they rest on the Sabbath, Holy Saturday, in obedience with the commandment. There is darkness on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene gets to the tomb, perhaps to bring those spices and perfumes that had been prepared. Eyes likely red from weeping and maybe lack of sleep. Perhaps she was at the tomb because there was nothing else to do. There was nowhere else to be. There was nothing else that mattered or would ever matter again after the horrific and terrifying events that they had witnessed on the Friday just gone. In John's Gospel, the first time we meet Mary Magdalene is at the foot of the cross. We know little of her history. The little we know about her is from the other Gospels. But here, she cements her place in history as the first apostle. The first to bring news of the empty tomb. And a greater privilege yet to be the first to see, to meet, and to speak to the risen Jesus. I imagine Mary Magdalene going to the tomb, seeing the stone rolled away, and sort of thinking, oh, for goodness sake, not something else. The despair, I can, I, I, this is just me, it's not in Scripture, obviously, but I just imagine that despair as she goes and thinks, what on earth now? And you can hear it when she says, where have they taken my Lord? I just imagine it being a cry of despair. But Jesus isn't there. She sees the stone rolled away. She runs back to Simon Peter and the other disciple. They then both run to the tomb. And the other disciple gets there first, sees the strips of linen, but he doesn't go in. Simon Peter arrives, that wonderful man, just representing humanity in many ways. And he goes in. Then the other disciple goes in. I don't know if you've ever realized, but in those few short verses, there is more about running than there is in any of the other Gospels combined, according to Tom Wright, and I'm not doubting Tom Wright. But the detail that John tells us about, the strips of linen lying there, the burial cloth from Jesus' head lying separately, Someone has not only taken the body out of the tomb, but they've gone to the trouble of unwrapping it. Not an easy task. Think back to two weeks ago. Lazarus, he had to be unwrapped from the cloth as he walked out of the grave. The body has been unwrapped. And they've laid out the cloth for effect. The cloth and the one wrapped around Jesus' head. Now, interestingly, archaeologists have found at least one first century tomb just to the south of where Jesus' tomb likely was. And they see just that, grave clothes wrapped around what's left of the bones. It's likely somebody who died with the persecution of Jerusalem that never had chance to be buried properly. But Mary, Peter, and the other disciple, there must have been a sense of puzzlement at what is going on. But then the other disciple goes in. He sees and he believes. They realize that this is a moment of new creation. This is a moment of a new dawn. This is the moment when the darkness is gone and the sun is shining. And then we have that wonderful, tender exchange between Mary and the gardener. It's an intimate moment. 
But it's through that moment we get another glimpse that everything has changed. To the careful reader of John's Gospel, we now see that something extraordinary has taken place. Not only to Jesus, that's extraordinary enough, but to the way that the world is. The way that God is. And the way that the God and the disciples now are. Up until this point in John's Gospel, Jesus has referred to God as the Father or my Father. He has called his followers disciples, servants, friends. Now, everything has changed. Feel the force of verse 17 in that knowledge. Go instead to my brothers. I am going to my Father and your Father. I am going to my God and your God. Something has altered decisively. Something has been achieved. A new relationship has sprung to life. The disciples are welcomed into a new world. A world where they can know God the way that Jesus knew God. They can be intimate children with their father. They are now true Israelites at last. Israel's calling was to be God's son. God's firstborn. Exodus 4.22 this vocation is something that we know Israel has struggled with throughout the Old Testament. But the case now is that everyone who follows Jesus is welcomed in his name as a beloved son or a beloved daughter. Friends, that's me and that's you. He is Jesus' father. He is our father. He is Jesus God. He is our God. Because of what has been achieved on these three momentous days. And in some ways, we've come full circle from where Jesus' earthly ministry began at his baptism. Because what does the Spirit say, what the Father say when the Spirit descends like a dove? You are my son. You are my daughter in whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. And now, Jesus is saying that we too are his brothers, that we too have our Father. It's not the same in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is specific to John's Gospel. We are now brothers and sisters in Christ because of what has been achieved. Mary then looks in the tomb, and suddenly within a verse, angels have appeared. Perhaps they were there when Peter and the other disciple were looking in in the tomb. Perhaps Mary could only see the angels through her tears that had been shed. Perhaps we can only see angels through tears. Or when we're afraid, because when people are afraid, angels say, don't be afraid. In fact, it's the first thing angels say when they come and meet a human being throughout Scripture. When people are in tears, perhaps angels ask why then there is this beautiful, beautiful, tender moment when Jesus asks Mary why she's crying. And he says, Mary. And then she realizes who he is. So in some ways, we can use four words to summarize this. Come. See. Go. Go. In Matthew's account of the resurrection, the angel says to Mary, come and see the place where he lay. There is an invitation to come in and see the place where Jesus' body was. There's a lot to be said for that invitation to us. We too are called by God to say, come and see where he was laid. That is how we can be sure of the resurrection, friends. If we don't believe in the resurrection, then what's the point of us being here? 
the resurrection happened. It's not a story of fiction. It's not an analogy of something. It is the truth. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That is a truth. And I know that truth is a strange concept in today's world out there. But in the church, it is the truth. Why? Because it's in this book. It is a mighty act of God. It's that important. It's one of those crucial parts of the whole gospel. It's why it appears in there. We see for ourselves that the tomb is empty. Jesus is not there, for he is risen. We too are invited to come and see where he laid. We are invited to come and see the dawn of a new creation. We are invited to see that Jesus is resurrected and we too are invited to join in with this. Jesus says, Mary, and she says, Rabboni. Jesus says your name this morning and we declare Rabboni to him. There is a lot of power in a name and I know we've spent a bit of time looking at names. There is a lot of power in a name. And Jesus calls us by our name. And we declare, Rabboni. We are included. The invitation to come and see applies to us. The disciples are then told to go and to tell. Had they not gone and told others, who continue to tell others, who continue to tell others, we wouldn't be sat here today celebrating something extraordinary, the miraculous power of God. Go and tell is an important part of the gospel. It's something that we are all called to do as we know from the Great Commission in Matthew. And looking back to John's gospel and the reading we had today, verse 17, we see as we looked at earlier, my brothers, my sisters, your father, your God, Mary does just that in verse 18. She tells us, she goes to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she tells them what he said. Come and see the empty tomb. Go and tell others. What a wonderful mission plan. If only the church would do just that. And I don't mean just this church, I mean the the universal church. If we were to do just that, imagine how different this world might be. One of the ways we can go and tell can be pulled out from John's Gospel. The main theme is that a new creation has dawned. For centuries, the church has used the imagery of darkness into light. And that is not lost at Easter. Those of us who were up at Warden Hill this morning were supposed to see the sunrise, but the clouds blocked it. But we lit the candle that we brought back to show the light shining in the darkness. Think of that wonderful prologue to John's Gospel. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. That is what we see today. That the darkness will not overcome the light. Friends, no matter how dark it feels, the light is still lit. It's there. We lit it this morning. It symbolizes Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. It's a light that reminds us that death is not the end, that life will triumph, that Jesus has triumphed over the grave, and that is what we celebrate today. I've been really taken by Bishop Jill Duff's vision of beacons being raised up across the land. Bishop Jill, she's the Bishop of Lancaster, and she's one of the few bishops who is speaking out about the current trajectory of the Church of England. She talks of beacons of hope being lit up in the darkest of places. The Lord has taken her on a journey over the last, I think it's about 10 years, looking at beacons, and she describes the beacons that she has seen as men, women, and children who have caught God's holy fire. And I want to share something with you that's from Bishop Jill. It is a bit lengthy, but bear with me. I'm just going to share, I read it yesterday. You might have seen it if you're on Facebook. She says this, For me, the beacons that I see are the men, women, and children who've caught God's holy fire. I've shared that bit. They bring light, hope, and love 
into their families, communities, and networks. She says, I see pinpricks of light in lives everywhere. Some are like tall lighthouses, giants of faith on the cliffs in the storm. Some are like tiny, flickering candles. Their very fragility giving hope. Some are like fires crackling in the heart, gently inviting others home to the warmth of God's love. What is the fire that lights these beacons? Or should I say, who is the fire? It's God's own spirit, whose universe-shattering power brought Jesus back from the dead on the first Easter day. He is the gift that Jesus promised when he left so that men, women, and children in all times and all places could experience him with them. He's described as the deposit guaranteeing what is to come, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. She goes on, I like to think of the spirit of Jesus as showing us a trailer of that welcoming heavenly fire burning in the heart of the Father. The message of these beacons is simply this. We miss you. Please come home. We miss you. Please come home. She then finishes by saying, may this Easter season be a time when many beacons are lit across every sphere of our society throughout our nations. May sparks of recognition of the risen Jesus flicker into life in hearts across our land. May God visit us with his spirit, pouring out his fiery love from heaven and calling out a new generation of Christian leaders who will in turn call many lost sons and daughters home. Amen. That's a vision I want to be part of, friends. I hope that's a vision that you want to be part of. We are those beacons that she is talking of. We are the men, women, and children who have the Spirit of God in us, the same Spirit that brought Jesus back to life to be beacons of hope and beacons of light out there where it is dark. We don't do this on a Sunday to feel good. We don't just come here because it's nice to gather together and sing a few songs and la-di-da. We come here on a Sunday to be filled up so that we can go outside to be those beacons of hope to a hurting world. When I first read that article, I was brought to tears. And I got a real sense that that is what the Lord is wanting to happen across this land. I believe that the world is caught up in that holy Saturday moment of waiting in despair, denial, and grief. That's what's out there. But Jesus is wanting to bring them through to the dawn of a new creation, to the dawn of the resurrection where we find ourselves. Are we willing to take the command of Jesus seriously to go and tell others? Are we willing to go to those dark places and be the beacons of light? Are we willing to be the people who call out someone's name and lead them to faith? Who is it that you need to go to and say their name so that they can turn around and say, Jesus Christ is Lord? In John's Gospel, we're invited to celebrate with the disciples that this new day has dawned, that everything has changed forever. The work of the cross where our sins are taken away and the curtain temple is torn in two is then understood from the very words that Jesus utters, that we are now included. We're no longer strangers. We're no longer simply friends. But we are brothers and sisters. It shows the magnitude of what is achieved through the cross and the resurrection. They can't be taken in isolation. It doesn't work if you just look to the cross and if you just look to the resurrection. It doesn't work. But also, we can't miss out Holy Saturday, that day of despair and grief between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Because that is exactly where the world is. They're stuck. We need to be that beacon of hope to bring the world through from the horror of the cross, the despair and grief of Holy Saturday to the wonderful joy of the resurrection 
And I believe that is what the Lord is calling us to do in this time. It feels at the moment that more and more of what we know is slipping away. It feels that the ground is shifting sand beneath our feet. Yet for those of us who have heard the invitation to come and see, those of us who have passed through that holy Saturday moment into the glorious dawn of the resurrection, whilst the world may feel shifting sand, we who have come through to the dawn of new creation have our feet on a firm foundation that is Jesus Christ, who has beaten death. We think back to the foolish builder who built his house on the sand. But the one who built his house on the rock is safe. We build our lives on the foundation stone of Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has beaten death, who is resurrected, and for a new creation has dawned. Our foundations are firm. Our foundations are based on the Word of God. We now need to go and tell. We need to be the beacons that Bishop Jill speaks of. We need to be present in those dark places of society, ministering to those in need, those who are on the edge, those who have not yet heard the good news of the resurrection. I pray, along with Bishop Jill, that we who are in the new creation who have witnessed the resurrection, who know that it is true, will be those beacons calling out a new generation. That we would be the beacons calling out to those who are lost. We miss you. Please come home. We miss you. Please come home. Who in your network needs to hear the good news of the resurrection? Who do you need to be a beacon of hope to this day? Who is God asking you to go and tell? Who do you need to say, we miss you? Please come home. I've had a vision of this church with the people just plowing through the doors as we go out and we are those beacons of hope. I see the masses coming in because they want to know about Jesus. Let's make that vision a reality, friends. Come and see. Go and tell. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Are we ready? We need the Holy Spirit to do this. We know that it's coming. We know that in 50 days' time we celebrate Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out. It's the same spirit that brings Jesus through death into the resurrected life. That same power lives in me and in you. That same power can and will do mighty things through us. Let me ask you this. Are we ready?